Um, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to this meeting. Um, Dr. Mark Okren is the linguist who created the Klingon language in Star Trek. Um, Klingon is, if you don't know, the most uh, widely spoken fictional language. It's used in numerous books, movies, a Duolingo course, and even in an opera. Uh, Dr. Okren also worked on several other Star Trek languages and created the Atlantean language in the Disney film Atlantis, the Lost Empire. Um, on behalf of the uh, Harvard Undergraduate Linguistics Society and the Harvard Radcliffe Science Fiction Association, thank you so much for being here. We, we really appreciate um, your time and we're excited to hear whatever you have to thank say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as I was telling it, uh, Adam earlier, I prepared a PowerPoint thing only because otherwise you just have to sit staring at me in a little Zoom box for now and that's kind of boring. So we'll, we'll, we'll see if this works. This is an experiment for me because I'm a very low tech kind of person. Did it work? Uh, no, we haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen it. Oh, because I have to hit that other button. Aha. I have to do this first. Nice. Okay. I think we can see it. Yep. You can see it now. There's one big Klingon thing, right? Perfect. Perfect. Good. Okay. Now we'll see if I remember how it works. Um, this is, this is, I've, First, thank you for inviting me. It's very, very, very cool. Uh, it's kind of strange for me to be addressing a group like this because uh, the Zoom part isn't because I'm getting used to Zoom. But you know, usually when I'm talking about Klingon, I'm talking to a Star Trek convention or a sci-fi convention or something like that. But I've talked at universities before in places like the Library of Congress, um, the, the Peace Corps. I'm not sure where they're sending their next set of volunteers the NSA, but we're not going to talk more about that. But most of the time when I talk to these people, uh, what they want to know is what's involved in making up a language, what's involved in, in conlanging. Uh, some colleges and universities offer courses. We were just talking about this, about, about constructed languages. Uh, there's one that I looked at their catalog. Ah, why doesn't it work? Hello. Everything froze up now. This might not work at all. What are you trying to do? Start the thing. Start the PowerPoint. Why doesn't it work? Wait, we we see a PowerPoint. Uh, the the Klingon symbol. Yeah, I can't make it work. Oh. Oh, no! No, do it back to that. Yes, now what do you see? Oh, I think you're on the last slide. No, that's uh, the first slide. Okay, now you're on the first slide. It, it should work now, I think. Aha! There it goes. Good. Anyway, this is this is from the catalog of this of this invented language course. Um, what it says is students learn from contemporary linguistics to analyze language structures and understand how they relate to creator intentions. And the phrase creator intentions is the one that kind of stuck out at me uh, because I've created languages and I've had intentions uh, in mind as I was creating them, it got me to thinking. So first, a little bit of background about uh, language invention, people, you know, making up languages is nothing new. People have probably been making up languages as long as people have been talking. Uh, the first documented, ah, it, it did it again. This won't work, so we'll just have to stare at me. I don't know why it's not working. I don't want to sit there and say creative intentions the whole time. It's incompatible with something. Hello. Ah, how'd that happen? What do you see now? We see the lingua, lingua ignota. Do you see a chat box? N no chat oh. box. I don't know how, anyway, I'll just chug along here and you'll see whatever you see. Um, the first <laughs> the documented language is what I was gonna say, conlang was this lingua Ignota, which was created in the 12th century by a, a German nun who later became a saint. 
this language was probably just to be used for some kind of mystical sorts of purposes. Probably the most well-known one is uh, Esperanto. It's from the 19th century, created by this ophthalmologist, then Samenhoff. It was supposed to be a language that everyone would use in addition to, not instead of whatever their native language happened to be. And it's kind of intended role as a widespread second language probably got usurped by English somewhere along the line. Uh, but there's still a lot of speakers of Esperanto, 100,000 speakers or something like that is, is the estimate. It says my internet connection is unstable. Anyway, all kinds of things going on here. Uh, another reason people create languages sometimes is because they think natural languages are just too fuzzy and consistent and sloppy, and this makes communication difficult. So their intention is to clear things up. Uh, sometimes languages are, des are designed just for fun. The intention is curiosity, just to have a good time. It's languages like Kalen, which is a language so made up that has no verbs, or Tokipona. Yes, here we go, it won't work again. I have to scare, stare at Samenhof the whole time. Um, it's a language that only has 14 sounds, maybe 120 words, and you can say anything in it. Another kind of conlang is one that's intended to be part of an artistic endeavor, like a novel or a movie. These are sometimes called art langs. Uh, Tolkien languages, like for the Lord of the Rings and stuff like that, are, are those. Uh, and then there's languages like Klingon and Navi from Avatar and the languages from Game of Thrones and all that. And for these TV and movie languages, the intentions of the language creator uh, have to mesh with, if not be subservient to the intentions of the movie maker. So how does language in a film fit in with the filmmaker's intention? So let's look at just arbitrarily for no reason at all, movies that have to do with outer space. I don't know why I picked those. In, uh, in shows like that, language is key. If the earth people and the outer space people can't communicate with each other, there's no story or else that is the story. Like Arrival, if you saw that movie maybe four or five years ago. Uh, most of the time though, the, the plot does not involve dealing with the language. So they have to get around the problem somehow or other. Since we're dealing with science fiction, uh, we're not limited by what we know here on earth. You know, the, 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 the non-earth language does not have to fit human mouths and tongues and all that kind of stuff. It needs to fit with, with whatever the aliens have or do. Uh, in fact, the language doesn't have to be spoken at all or, or, or signed. It could be based on light or smell or taste or touch or posture or vibrations or brainwaves or who knows. But despite all of these options in the movies, Almost always the alien language is spoken and almost always it's spoken by people, that is to say actors who have very human mouths and tongues and things like that. So in the movies and TV shows, there's been about five different approaches to dealing with these alien languages, so-called, still doesn't work. One is just ignore it. If you can, if you can turn the thing off on your end, that'd be great. Uh, what is this? The issue is you might you might not be uh, you might have the PowerPoint screen selected if if you like have another window open it, it won't go, um, but if it's not that then I I don't I don't know what it could be. Okay, I have all kinds of windows open, but maybe that's it. Um, doesn't matter. So we'll ignore it, just like I'm talking about ignoring here. So if, if there's a way to, to, I can't even I can't even stop it. Maybe if you like didn't full screen it anymore and then just like went like slide by slide, like clicking. Oh, do you see that? No. Uh, we, we don't see anything different now. What do you oh, see? Yeah, now we do. Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. I don't know what's going on here. I have no control over this thing. <laughs> now there's a blue screen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is not the way this was supposed to go at all, but I, I, I lost my mouse, I think is what's the, going on. What do you see now? The, the day the earth stood still. Uh, well, you can see what you're supposed to see. I don't know why it's working like that, but let's let it go. Um, 
So alien languages and films, which is what I wanted to talk about, as I say, one thing that people have done with it is just ignore the problem altogether, pretend that it's not an issue. Uh, everyone just speaks English or whatever language the film is in. And if you've watched all these films, it's probably, you've probably noticed that everyone in the galaxy, everyone in the universe happens to speak very good 20th, 21st century North American English unless they're the villains and they speak British English. And this is explained in, in, in various ways. Sometimes they talk about a universal translator or they talk about putting a fish in your ear if you know what I'm talking about. Uh, it's kind of ridiculous or far-fetched, but it gets around the problem. Or they just ignore it altogether and hope that nobody notices that everyone is speaking English. A second approach is gobbledygook. Just make stuff up. Uh, it's usually based on the language of the filmmaker. So a good example of that is The Day the Earth Stood Still. A uh, famous phrase in there is, is klatu barada nikto. Uh, nobody knows what that means. Klatu is somebody's name, but other than that, no one knows what it means. But it's nonsense. But, but good English syllables, all of them. There's nothing strange phonologically about that phrase. Another approach is the same thing, the gobbledygook approach, but based on a foreign language, not the language of the movie. Um, best example of that is probably Star Wars. Uh, the basic approach used in Star Wars for languages is listen to a language other than English and imitate the sounds and words and phrases. And don't worry if you get it wrong. And don't worry if a couple of real words happen to creep in there, that's okay. So Ewok language, for example, uh, is based on a combination of Tibetan and Nepali and Kalmyk, which is a, a Mongolian kind of language. Uh, Hatiz, language of Jabba the Hutt, is based on Quechua from Peru. Uh, Kanji Club from The Force Awakens, more recent movie, is based on a bunch of Indonesian languages. Sulistis, so, so we lost a slide. Uh, Sulistis, which is the language of, of Nien Num, is one of the characters, is a land of Kaurasian sidekick, uh, is based on some languages from Kenya, because the guy who did the voicing speaks those languages and is supposed to say gobbledygook, except he snuck in some real words in there, so when the show played in Kenya, they got a big kick out of it. Uh, the next approach that's used brings us to Star Trek. It stopped working. Uh, Star Trek. Uh, in Star Trek on TV in the original series, the most frequently heard language was Vulcan, of course. And they said words like Lirpa, it's Mr. Spock with a Lirpa, this kind of a weapon. Kalifi, which means challenge. And the only sentence in Vulcan in the original series is Kroika, which means stop, cut it out. Uh, these things again is gobbledygook based on English. Lirpa is leer, like you're leering at somebody, and pa like like papa. Kalifi sounds like money you pay for a dog to do something or other. But in they made we got around to making movies, Star Trek the Motion Picture, they added another way to create the alien language, and that's lip syncing. So there's a scene there where Mr. Spock is being uh, inducted, if that's the right word, he's participating, maybe that's nicer, in a ritual called Kolinar. Uh, the dialogue when they filmed this scene was originally in English, but then they decided to switch it to Vulcan. And the reason they decided is a couple of reasons. One in terms of the, the story is it's a, a Vulcan ceremony taking place on Vulcan and nobody is there except for Vulcans. So why aren't they speaking Vulcan? But they thought of that after the fact. The real reason for making the change, you know, the Hollywood reason, insider reason, is they just didn't like the way it played. Uh, and so they wanted to improve it somehow. And also they knew that in the film at some point they were going to be speaking Klingon. So they thought it was just unfair that the Klingons got to speak their language and the Vulcans didn't. So they decided to make a Vulcan language. So the technique was to create gibberish, to create gobbledygook that matches the lip movements that were already filmed and then have an actor dub it in, in the same way the actors dub in uh, uh, foreign languages and, you know, in, in, in foreign films. So here, the lips had to match up as closely as possible. 
So the lip sync version of this Vulcan was created mostly by a guy from UCLA named Harmut Scharf, uh, who studied Sanskrit and things like that. Although one of the producers, John Polville, and one of the actors, James Dillon, who played Scotty, uh, they participated in this as well. Most famous Vulcan line of all, of course, is live long and prosper. And they changed that to Tif Torres Mosma. So I don't know who, I have no idea what you're seeing, whether you can see me or not, but you can try this at home on your own. Uh, you know, without making any noises, go live long and prosper, Tif Torres Mosma, Tif Torres Mosma, live long and prosper. Shouldn't be able to tell the difference. And so they dubbed it in. Uh, so that's the way that, of course, when the speaker was <clears throat> when the speaker was off camera, they could do whatever they wanted because you don't have to see anything. I don't know what you're seeing now. Um, anyway, they liked, they liked the technique so much they used it again in the next Star Trek picture, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. There's a scene where uh, a, new, a new Vulcan named Savik and Mr. Spock are having a conversation about Captain Kirk. Uh, Savik says, he's never what I expect. Spock says, what, what, what surprises you? She says, he's so human. And Spock says, well, nobody's perfect, Savik. That's, that's the scene. That was the same deal. When the scene was filmed, uh, they spoke English. They decided to change it to Vulcan. And the reason for making the change in this case was, was because the, uh, as a result of editing the film, the original lines of dialogue didn't, one of the lines didn't make any sense anymore. The tense was wrong or something. So rather than film it all over again, which is gonna be very expensive, they just put in this gibberish and put in whatever subtitles they wanted. Uh, and another reason they changed is because they cut out some dialogue from the scene about uh, about Spock and Savik <clears throat> talking to each other. And Spock tells Savik, you know, we're never gonna be humans. We're not them. We're always on the outside. We're always the other. But they cut those, those lines out and they thought that by having them speak Vulcan to each other would emphasize their otherness, which is a point they wanted to get across uh, without having them to leave in the dialogue, which they didn't like for, for whatever reason. Anyway, the technique was the same. One of the lines was, and I did this, uh, one of the lines was, uh, he's very human. Change that to and so it's the same thing. He's very human, should lips should match up. And then what they did is something very sneaky, which is they changed the subtitle to he's so human to throw you off. So you wouldn't know that it's just lip syncing. Uh, anyway, yeah, so I worked with Kirstie Alley, who played Savik one day and taught her to say this stuff. Then I worked with Leonard Nimoy another day. Mr. Spock taught him how to say this stuff. Went away, realizing that I had just taught Mr. Spock how to speak Vulcan. Thought that was very cool. And that's the end of my career with Star Trek and probably the end of my career with movies altogether. But a year and a half, two years later, I got a call and they said they're making another movie, Star Trek Three. And this time uh, they're gonna have Klingons speaking their own language. And this created a new technique for these things, which is conlanging, because this time the language was gonna be a real language. Now, the first time I'm aware of a conlang being used in TV or movies was in an old kids TV show in the 70s called Land of the Lost. Uh, they did a remake of it in the 90s. And there was a movie 10, 12 years ago. It's a story about a father and two kids who somehow end up in an alternate universe where there's these dinosaurs and cave people and stuff. And the cave people are called Pakuni. They speak their own language called Pakuni. They're here, if you can see them, I don't know what you're seeing <laughs> on the left. Uh, that language was made up by a linguist from UCLA named Victoria Framken. And it's a real language. It's 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 a con language. You know, it's complete with grammar and proper vocabulary and everything else. Uh, David Peterson pointed out that Pakuni was probably the first time that anybody got paid to make up a language. Anyway, uh, after that, there was a uh, movie in the '80s called Quest for Fire. Um, it's about another primitive society. I mean, this is supposed to take place maybe eighty thousand years ago. Uh, 
they, they, this society has a fire, they keep burning because they need it and they don't know how to make fire so they can't ever let it go out. But of course it goes out, otherwise it wouldn't be a movie. And they go off and on a quest to bring back the fire. There's several tribes and several languages spoken in this movie. There's no English at all. I don't know why there should be any English. It's a French Canadian film based on a Belgian novel. But anyway, there's no French in it either. It's 100% conlangs. The language of the main group, the Ulam, was created by Anthony Burgess, who's more well known for Clockwork Orange. And his idea was to come up with a language that could have, after time, developed into what linguists call Proto-Indo-European, which is the language that most of the languages from Europe and India come from. But this was predates Proto-Indo-European. It's earlier than that. But he made the language be Proto-Indo-European-like as opposed to Chinese-like or Swahili-like or something or other, so that it could maybe develop into Proto-Indo-European. Uh, it's got proper grammar and vocabulary and everything else. Um, it doesn't have a life after the film, unfortunately. There was another group in the film, another group of, of, of these primitive people called the Yavaka, and they spoke a language that was created based on some Canadian native languages, uh, primarily Cree and Inuit. Uh, and apparently when the native speakers, real native speakers, those languages saw the film, they got a kick out of it because whatever they guys were saying did not match the subtitles at all. Anyway, as far as I know, the next language created for movie or TV was Klingon. This is what Klingons used to look like. Now, if you Google me, it'll probably say that I created or that I invented Klingon, but in fact, there was Klingon before me uh, the first time Klingon was ever mentioned was in uh, one of the original series episodes called The Trouble with Tribbles, which is sort of a famous one. There's a Klingon named Korax, that's this guy, uh, who insults the Enterprise by saying that the Quadrant knows that the ship is designed like a garbage scow, and that's why they're all learning how to speak Klingonese. And then there's a big fight. Uh, but we never hear Klingonese. He never speaks it nor does any other Klingon in any episode of the original series. Everybody speaks English all the time. The only thing we know about this Klingonese language is character names, which is Kang and Kor and Kras and Mara is the only female name we, we hear. All of these based on English phonology, it's the Gauligook approach. But no matter, uh, the Klingons are not us. And this is once again indicated by the fact that even though we don't hear it, they have another language. We finally do hear what this language is all about some 12 years later in Star Trek, the motion picture. And at this point, Klingons start to look like this. At the beginning of the movie, we see in, <clears throat> inside one of the Klingon ships and the commander, Captain, this guy is barking out commands in some strange language with subtitles. And he says, Juntach, which means evasive. And Bach, which means fire the torpedo, Bach. This language was created by John Polville, the producer I mentioned earlier, and James Doohan, Scotty. Uh, there was actually an earlier version created by Scharf, who did the Vulcan, but uh, they didn't like it because it sounded too much like an Earth language. So their language had more nonsense, syllables and clicks and groans and hisses and things like that. There's maybe half a dozen, eight lines of this stuff. And that was it, language-wise, for about five years. There's actually a little bit more, actually there's a lot more, but it's really low volume, you can't hear it, so it doesn't count. Anyway, they made another movie about Klingons called Star Trek III, The Search for Spock. Now the Klingons look like this. Um, the Klingons are gonna be the villains, and Harv Bennett, who was the writer and the producer of that movie, decided there should be a real Klingon language, and he wanted it to sound real, so we decided to come up with a complete language, not just random uh, words and gibber syllables. Now, I just said that the plan was have to have a complete language. That's not entirely true. Um, and this is important for knowing uh, what Klingon is and, and how it developed. My plan, or my intention, if you want to use that word again, uh, was to come up with what was needed for the film, nothing more. So it was like building a set. If you've ever seen a movie set, you know, the front of it looks really good and the back of it is just a bunch of plywood. If, if the set is a house and there's a door or a window, but in the story, no one ever has to open the window or go through the door, the door doesn't open and the windows don't open. Okay, they only build what they have to build. 
And it was the same thing with Klingon. I only built what I had to build. If it wasn't a word or a, or a kind of grammatical thing needed for the film, if it wasn't in the script, I didn't make it up. If it was in there, I made it up. If it wasn't in there, I didn't. Anyway, my job, they told me, was to create a non-human language. That was my instructions. So what does that mean? Well, languages have certain things in common, uh, vowels and consonants and sentences, syntax, words, uh, and certain tendencies. So certain sounds tend to go together in the same language. Certain sounds don't. Certain grammatical things are found together in the same language. Certain ones are not. Some grammatical features and uh, phonological features are very common. Some are not common and, and so on. Well, uh, all this stuff is, is sometimes called universals, which in the context of Star Trek seems kind of pretentious when you're talking about earth languages, but anyway. Since Klingon uh, is not a human language, it doesn't have to follow these human language rules, I figured. On the other hand, there was a practical matter to consider, and that is that all of the speakers of the language that I was gonna deal with are human actors. So they had to be able to say the sounds, they had to be able to pronounce them, they also had to be able to learn them and memorize this stuff fairly quickly. So about 70% of the sounds of Klingon are good North American English sounds. Uh, I have no idea what you're able to see now, but here's, you're playing on sounds, the ones in, in, in black are the ones that are the same as, as good old American English. And the ones in blue, if they're there, are the sounds that are off a little bit. The, 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 there's a, a, a the, the DSQR is because they're English sounds, but they're different in Klingon from American English. So it's, it's a gersha, k, r, the Q and for a, for, a, for a K kind of sound. Uh, there's, there's gruff sounds that they really want in there. The r, and the and the there's a t that I put in there because I thought that was kind of cool. The apostrophe, if you can see it, I have no idea if you can see it or not, um, is a glottal stop. It's a little break between syllables or a very quick, uh, abrupt ending to a word or abrupt onset to a word. We have it in English in the middle of, of things like between the two uhs or uh-uh and stuff like that. But it's, it's all over the place in Klingon. Aha, there it is in IPA. That proves that it can actually be pronounced. That's, that's, what, that's what the sounds are. IPA is the International Phonetic Alphabet. Uh, I tried to do non-common things with the grammar as well, not just the sounds. Uh, basic thing in a language is the word order. You have the subject, the verb, and the object, right? The subject is the doer of the action. The verb is the action. The object is the receiver of the action. So in English, you have dogs bite people. Dogs is the subject. Bite is the verb. People is the object, the receiver of the, of the, of the verbal action and so on. Uh, if you're gonna say these things, you have to say them in some order or other. So mathematically, there's six possibilities. Um, I don't know what you're seeing on the screen, but it's verb, verb subject, object, object, verb, subject. Anyway, there's, there's six of them. And if you look all around the world, you'll find languages representing all six where their basic order is that you can move things around in English you can say dogs or, you know people dogs bite you can change things around but the normal neutral order there's examples all around the world of, of all six but some of them are a whole lot more common than others so the ones with the subject first 87 90 percent of human languages do that the one where the object comes first about one percent of the world's languages do that so I picked for Klingon, the one where the object comes first, then the verb, then the subject, which happens to be backwards from English, but I didn't pick it because it's backwards from English. I picked it because it's the least common in the world and therefore from that certain point of view, the least human, which is not to disparage the people whose languages really do this on their own. There's a few of those in, in Brazil and Mexico and Central America. Now it's not working again. Oh, there's something. I don't know what you're seeing. Oh, well, jump the gun. 
Um, one of the things I was going to mention before I jumped the gun here is another important feature of, of Klingon grammar is I decided there's no verb to be in Klingon. And the reason for that is because to be is such a common verb in English. It's all over the place uh, in, all, in all kinds of uses. If you count up how many times I said to, in, since I started talking, you know, to be is MR or all that stuff. It's, it's hundreds. Uh, therefore, we're going to just take it out of Klingon altogether. Other languages on earth don't have to be or don't have to be in certain tenses or something like that. But since it's so common in English, it's not in Klingon. So now I wanted to shift gears to this, <laughs> to, to, to this other movie, Ad Ad Atlantis. This is a Disney cartoon that was, uh, came out, I think, in, in 2001. It's its 20th anniversary this year. Uh, this is a really good movie. You should all go see it. The hero is a linguist. That's not very common in movies. The story in the film is the team of explorers goes to Atlantis and they encounter Atlanteans who speak Atlantean. Uh, the explorers don't speak Atlantean. So the Atlanteans decide they'll uh, accommodate and they try out a whole bunch of earth languages, Chinese and French and Spanish and so on until they hone in on, hone in on English and continue speaking English for the rest of the film, which is of great relief to the English speaking audience. So one of the members of the exploring group uh, says to Milo, the linguist, he's the front guy in the picture here, uh, how, did, how did they learn our language so fast? And Milo, the linguist says, oh, that's because their language must be based on a root dialect, just like the Tower of Babel is his theory. In other words, it's like the language that all the languages on earth come from. So I saw that line in the script and I told the producer and the directors that wasn't linguistically sound. I said, if there was such a thing as a root dialect then all languages should come from that. So Atlantean wouldn't have any special place uh, marking it as, as, as being you know, different in that regard. And also if there was such a thing, Milo couldn't possibly know what it would be like so I came up with a few other reasons that the Atlanteans could, you know, latch on to English so quickly. But the line about, about the root dialect stayed in the film anyway. But I was not about to make up a language that was based on a root dialect, whatever that's supposed to mean. But what I did instead is try to make a language that even though it's not a root dialect or doesn't come from a root dialect, has characteristics such that Milo might come with a theory that it does even if his theory is wrong. So Atlantean is very universal. What I mean by that, it has very common sounds, very common kind of grammar, words from ancient and reconstructed languages and stuff like that. So it's kind of the uh, uh, Klingon in reverse or the anti-Klingon or something like that. So back to Klingon, which is what we're really talking about. What I did is I made up Klingon versions of all the lines in the script where the Klingons are supposed to be speaking Klingon. And I made up Klingon versions of all the lines in the script where the Klingons speak English uh, uh, to each other. In this, in this film, sometimes the Klingons, the Klingons will always, almost always spoke English when talking to non-Klingons. But amongst themselves, sometimes they spoke Klingon and sometimes they spoke English but I made up Klingon versions of all the lines where they spoke English to each other, just in case while we were filming, someone would come up to me and say, hey, why are they talking English? What's the Klingon version for that? I could say, here, say this, as opposed to, oh, let me go back and think about that, okay? The euro of those lines, but it helped flesh out the language and stuff, so it was, it was a good thing to do. Anyway, I wrote out all the lines in a strange transcription that you may or may not have seen on the screen here with the capital letters coming and going and stuff like that. Uh, I recorded the lines on, on cassette tapes, if anyone knows what a cassette tape is anymore these days. I sent everything off to Paramount. They gave it to the actors. The actors put the cassette tapes in their tape players in their car and practiced speaking Klingon as they drove down the freeway, spitting on their windows. Anyway, so now my creation, you know, my conlang, that does what I intended it to do, uh, gets a dose of reality, which is it has to uh, deal with the intention of the filmmakers. 
which is driven in part by the business side of show business. So the way it worked is this, you know, uh, on, on the set, my job was to coach the actors uh, and, and to approve the takes, basically. So, you know, if you know, when you make a movie, the, the director yells action and the actors do their thing. And then the director yells cut. And after the director yells cut, they'll check with the camera person, was that okay? And they'll say yes or no, there was a shadow of the microphone. Check with the sound person, was that okay? Yes or no, a truck went by. And if there was Klingon involved, they would check with me. Is Klingon okay? Yes or no, they said it wrong. And if they said it wrong, they would have to do it over again. Well, I learned very quickly not to say they said it wrong very often because they would always get annoyed if they had to do it over again. So if they said it wrong, but it sounded like Klingon to me, and remember that at this point, no one had ever heard Klingon except for me, but it sounded okay, I would just make a note. He was supposed to say two. He said toe. From now on, the word is toe. Okay, and we would keep going. So the language started to change as a result of this movie making, which is not to say that they didn't take it seriously. They took it very seriously. Uh, there's a line of film, there's, there's Commander, I guess that was his rank, Krug, who was the main villain played by, by Christopher Lloyd, you know, Doc Brown from Back to the Future and all that stuff. Um, he's supposed to give a command to one of his flights down there. And he's telling him there's another ship out there and I want you to aim at the engine only, don't blow up the ship. So what he says is gunner, which is ha, target, gosh, engine only. Like that, that's what he's supposed to say. So they shoot the scene and he says, like this. At this point, the director, who's Leonard Nimoy, right? Mr. Spock was my boss. Leonard Nimoy yells, cut, cut, cut. You're supposed to be talking Klingon, not French. Do it again. Okay, so they did it again. So they, you know, they, they were concerned about all this stuff. But minor pronunciations, you know, we, we, we kind of let go. So the, the vocabulary changed as a result of this kind of stuff, as did the grammar. Uh, there's another scene in the film later on where there's three prisoners on this planet and the prisoners over there on the right. And Krug is up in his ship, but he's got a, a I don't know, soldier or whatever you want to call this guy on the, on the left here with the knife. And Krug is, wants to get something out of Kirk. So he says to Kirk, he says, just to show you that I'm really serious with all of my threats here, I'm going to kill one of the prisoners. Then he gives a command to this guy and he's supposed to say, kill one of them, I don't care which one, all right? So the, to say that, I, yeah, I don't know what you're seeing here because it's covered up on my screen, is uh, object comes first. Remember the grammar lesson we just had? Object comes first. So one, wa, yechoch. Wa means one, yechoch means kill. Ye is a prefix that means it's an imperative, it's a command. Choch is kill. One, kill. Then somebody or other, I'm not concerned about. So kill one of them, I don't care which one. We rehearse the scene over and over and over and over again. What you call fight to shakhba, what you call fight to shakhba. Okay, time to shoot the scene. Uh, Krug says, you know, Kurt, to prove as, as I'm serious, I'm going to kill one of the prisoners. Then he tells this guy, Yehoch to shakhba. I have a feeling you're not seeing what I want you to see. Uh, he left off the wa and he left out the vite. And he knew it. And so as soon as the scene was over, he says, I blew it. I said the Klingon wrong. And Nimoy, the director says, Mark, how did the Klingon sound to you? I knew what I had to say is the Klingon sounded fine. And then I'm thinking, well, how is this going to work? Because what he really said was kill, which blows the whole thing. He's supposed to say one, kill one of them, right? How am I going to deal with this? So what I decided is that yeah is still a prefix that's imperative. It still means it's a command, but you only use it when there's a singular object. So it means kill one. It's fine. And dishakwe means I don't care. I don't, I'm not concerned. Something like that. So it was okay. So I had to you know change the ground. I had to make up a new prefix for kill plural, not for kill plural, for, for uh, imperative plural. And when I was working on the film, there was a lot of interest 
in the language amongst the crew, meaning the filmmaking crew, not, not, not the enterprise crew so much. Um, and I thought, you know, if they're interested, then there's this kind of person out there that I didn't know very much about and didn't have very much dealings with at that time called a Star Trek fan. I figured they might be interested in it too. So I proposed the idea of writing a book explaining how the language works. So I wrote this little book called The Klingon Dictionary. That's the way it came out in 1984, 1985. It's since then been expanded a bit, new cover and everything. Um, and I finished the book on time. The book was supposed to come out when the movie came out, but there was some kind of delay in the publication for some very boring bureaucratic reasons. And that was annoying, but it turned out to be a good thing. And it was a good thing because while we were waiting for the book to be published, the film went into post-production. In other words, all the editing and stuff like that. And during the post-production phase, they changed their mind about a few things. One was, remember I told you about all the lines I created that were you know, originally in English, but I had a Klingon version of it they didn't use. Well, now they wanted to change some of the English lines that the Klingons speak into Klingon. But now I had to do it by lip syncing because they weren't gonna change the film. So for example, this woman here, this Klingon woman uh, is going to, uh, she's talking to, to Krug in the other ship and she's, she goes, blah, 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 blah. I'm ready to transmit, she says in English when they filmed it, change that to Klingon, which came out to be which matches the lips actually pretty close. It worked, it worked in the film, I was impressed. Um, all of these except for shu were new words that I made up for the purpose of lip syncing uh, and, and some new, new grammar here too. Shu was already there because there was a sh in the original movie that, that meant ready, be ready. So, so that kind of fit. Another time, there it is, ready to transmit. They changed the subtitle. They left the I mouth once again to throw you off. Uh, another time, here's Krug again. And that scene where uh, he told the guy to blow up the ship, to blow up the engine, but not the ship. And the guy didn't do it. He blew up the ship instead. Krug is angry. See, he looks angry. And what he says to the guy is, I told you, you know, engine only, which is come up. I told you, engine only, that same again. They decided that that's not what the subtitle should say. The subtitle should say, I wanted prisoners. So now all of a sudden, means I wanted prisoners. Well, how's that gonna work? Well, the object comes first. The object of I wanted prisoners is prisoners. So kama pu must mean prisoners. So I decided kama is the word for prisoner. Pu is a plural suffix. I already had a plural suffix. Now I've got two plural suffixes. And while I was at it, actually I made up a third plural subject because uh, suffix, because why not? Joan, uh, there it is, kama pu. Joan was a new verb that means to capture. Ta became a new suffix that means to succeed. And nech actually had floating around already meaning, meaning want. So it sort of means I wanted to, cap to succeed in capturing prisoners in a spoken in a very angry way, leaving out pronouns. Fine, it works. We can get on with it. The subtitle is okay. Um, Anyway, because the, the book was delayed, I could incorporate all of these changes into the book so the book now matched the film, which is a very good thing because if the book came out when it was supposed to, it would not have matched the film. No one would have paid any attention. I probably wouldn't be talking to you right now, okay? It would have been a very, a very different future for, for, for Klingon. But anyway, now my book is published. Uh, I've got a, a compendium of all the words. I've got all the grammar explained to me. I don't have to memorize this stuff. I can look everything up. It makes life simple. Wrong. It made everything harder. Uh, because when I was working on the next couple of films, you know, Star Trek V, 
uh, and Star Trek VI. We don't talk about Star Trek IV because they don't talk Klingon in it. Uh, I had to pay attention to the book. Unlike with Star Trek III, where no one knew anything except for me, I could make stuff up as I was going along. If they made a mistake, I could say, okay, fine, no longer. If it didn't match the book, uh, we either had to shoot it over again, not likely, or I had to come up with new vocabulary, new grammar, whatever, to match the mistakes that the, that the actors, actors may have made. By this time, Star Trek was on a roll. It was all these new TV shows. So Star Trek The Next Generation and Space Nine were on the air and later Voyager came and Star Trek Enterprise. And Klingon was used by Klingons in all of these and by non-Klingons probably in, in, in all of these too. Uh, but how good the Klingon was in these depended on the particular writer or, uh, or producer of that episode. Um, sometimes they would consult with me uh, sometimes they would just get a hold of the dictionary and use it. And some of them understood about the grammar and all that stuff. And some of them didn't. Some of them understood how dictionaries work and some of them didn't. Um, so for example, there's a famous Klingon dish called Gach. Came up in one of the episodes. Uh, that's the word that they came up with. Uh, and they defined that as serpent worms in the episode. And I said, serpent worm? What in the world is a serpent worm? And then I remembered, there's a Klingon word in the dictionary, charg. And if you look that up, the definition is serpent, comma, worm. A serpent or worm is charg. Well, they ignored the comma or didn't see it or something and they come up with it. And they mangled the pronunciation. So now we've got this word, gach which is when you eat them as food, is what I decided. is the ones crawling around, and is the stuff that you eat. Uh, famous Klingon weapon is this thing, which is a bat left, right? They define, they define this as, as an honor sword. The word for honor, they looked it up in the dictionary, is bat. The word for sword is et. So it's a bat, et. Totally mangled that writing it into the script or pronouncing it or something and it came out all kinds of ways but they kind of settled on bat left which is a very non klingon thing phonologically so i kind of klingonized it a little bit into bet left bet left so that's the klingon way to say bat left bat left bat left whatever it was based on sort of a strange usage of the dictionary um they had it fun with grammar as well. Uh, there's a scene where Worf and this kid uh, are honoring their mothers. And so the writers looked up words so Worf would say a, a, an appropriate thing in this Klingon ceremony. And what he says is this. Shosh jij bak shosh. Which means literally, mother, I honor you. Those are those words one for one. Objects come first. Shosh, mother, okay. Uh, pronouns when uh, there's no verb to be, but pronouns can be used in a to be like way. We're not going to get into all that now. So, what, what Worf is really saying here is, I am a mother and you are honor, something like that. But I decided this is some ancient Klingon ceremony, so the grammar was very strange. But we got some good things out of this too, because they made up a name for the ceremony. The Rushtai is the bonding ceremony, which gave us the word Rushtai. They made that up, but I'm out of that. We got Rush, which means bond, and Tai, which means ceremony. So now lots of Klingon ceremonies end in Tai. You know, that, that, that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Uh, when, I, when I wrote the dictionary, uh, which was, you know, 35 years ago or something like that. I thought, this is honestly truly what I thought would happen with it, is that 
well, I hope people would buy it. When you write a book, you hope people are going to buy your book. So I hope people would buy it. And then I thought they would take it home, open it up, look at it, say, oh, wow, look, here's the Klingon word for shoe. Ha, 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 and put it on their coffee table. And once in a while, I'll thumb through it and find a Klingon word for something or other. And that would be the end of it. Well, people did buy the book. You know, I, I was right about that. But I was wrong about the rest because they read it and reread it and studied it and analyzed it intently and compiled a list of the typos and a whole new subculture started to develop, which is a culture of Klingon speakers. And first, uh, I think they kind of felt isolated, but at the same time this was getting going, which is the early nineties, uh, the internet was also getting going. So that people were able to find each other and a, and a community grew uh, initially online only, but eventually people started to actually meet up with each other. Now it's back to only online again, I guess. Um, they organized something called the Klingon Language Institute. Klingon Language Institute produced a journal, a, a refereed, peer refereed journal called Holkred, which is Klingon for linguistics, means language science. Uh, they hold an annual meeting called a Kep A. Kep is a meeting. A means big. So the big meeting is a convention uh, once a year. And in between times, smaller group of people get together for little meetings called a Kep Chom. It's a little meeting. Uh, there's one of these Kep Choms that takes place in Germany every year that's more popular than the Kep A. So people started calling that a Kep Chom A, which is a big little meeting. Um, and it's ungrammatical, but it's cute. They used to hold Klingon language summer camps in, uh, in upstate Minnesota someplace, where in the morning they would practice grammar, they would sit around the table, I guess, and conjugate verbs, you know, I kill, you kill, we kill, they kill, or whatever you do. Uh, in the afternoon they would play games, but they would keep score and all that in Klingon to learn the numbers. Uh, they'd play baseball. There's no Klingon way to say, you're safe, you're out. So they'd say, you're alive, you're dead, and stuff like that. So make, you, make use of the language. Uh, to teach the language, they came up with a correspondence course that was originally snail mail, uh, but now it's now now it's online. There's also now a Duolingo course that, that they didn't produce, but members of, of that organization produced. So far, there's only one textbook you can buy to learn Klingon from, uh, and it's in German. The vocabulary of the language continues to grow, uh, but it's still limited. It's only 4,000 words, maybe 4,500, I don't know, which is not a lot. So you might think that would limit what you can talk about and what you can do, but you would be wrong. Uh, Klingons like to sing. That's been established in the TV shows and stuff. So people have either written songs or translated songs. One of the first efforts that I'm aware of to translate a song into Klingon is a theme song to Sesame Street. Why that was a choice i'm not i'm not sure uh, there's klingon rap there's an eminem song called without me which came into uh total new words but the same the same rhythm and everything called which means there's no old warriors uh, there was a song by sixpence and on the richer a while back called kiss me there's a klingon version of that by the klingon uh, Klingon pop warrior who has a few CDs out now. The Klingon version of that is, is Yachop, which means bite me. Um, but she also does nicer songs. She, there's, a, there's a version of one of her CDs of which is literally over, uh, above the rainbow, it is somewhere. Um, there's translations of works of literature. There's the Epic of Gilgamesh has been translated into Klingon. Um, Sun The Art of War, which makes a lot of sense, actually, for that to be in Klingon. Uh, there's also the Dao De Jing. Uh, the Klingon, Klingon name of that translates as Teachings of the Old Master. And on the other end of the spectrum, there's The Little Prince, has been translated into Klingon. Uh, you can get the German Klingon version. There's no such thing as the English Klingon version because of copyright stuff. Um, well, the newest one, I think, is The Wizard of Oz, has now been translated into Klingon, and The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. 
and other projects uh, you know, are, are underway. There's one novel that's been written that's entirely in Klingon called Nukpopom, which means what's the song all about? Uh, there's now online a journal of new Klingon works, poems and stories and so on and so forth. Uh, people have started making YouTube videos entirely in Klingon, sometimes with subtitles, sometimes not. Um, when they turn on the automatic translator, subtitler thing in YouTube, okay, sometimes it thinks it's Dutch, sometimes it thinks it's German, and the translations are very, very strange. And then there's Shakespeare. Shakespeare and Star Trek actually have a relationship that goes way back. Uh, there's a lot of episode titles that are based on Shakespeare. Uh, there's plots that are actually based on Shakespeare. But it's kind of most obvious in Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. There's many Shakespeare lines quoted in that movie, uh, all of them in English, except for one. And that one was originally supposed to be in English, but I arrived on the set one day and encountered the director. Nick Meyer, and he said, I need one more line. I said, okay, what's that? To be or not to be. And I said, okay. And I thought, oh no, because in Klingon, there's no to be. So I said, I said, what, what if it means to live or not to live? He said, that's fine, go tell Chris. Chris is Christopher Plummer, the, the actor. Uh, so I looked it up in the dictionary. I have my dictionary, right? I looked it up. Live is yin. Okay, and there's a number of different ways I could have done to, to, to live or not to live. I kind of did it down and dirty. Live or live not. So yin, is live. Par or yin, again, live. Bet is a suffix, a negative suffix, not. Yin, par, yin, bet. Go tell Chris. So go tell Christopher Plummer. There he is. He says, okay, how do you say this line? I go, yin pa, yin be. He goes, yin, yin. That's too wimpy. Make up something else. That's not what he said, but that, that's what he meant. So I said, now what am I going to do? So I thought a bit, and I said, well, what, what, if, what if we say, tach pa, tach be. He goes, tach. Tach is good. Let's keep tach. Until that moment, Tach was a suffix that meant to continue doing whatever the verb is. So eat plus tach means keep on eating. Walk plus tach means keep on walking, something like that. Um, I kind of promoted it to be a verb in its own right. That means to go on, to continue, to endure. So tach, 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 bet, to go on or not to go on, to continue or not to continue. So that worked. Now, I had no idea at this point quite how this fit into the film because that wasn't going to be filmed until the next day. And the next day, we we're filming a big banquet scene. So the Klingons and the Federation folks get together. And the leader of the Klingon Empire, who's the guy on, on the far left here, says he'd like to propose a toast. He says, to the undiscovered country. And everyone just sits there not knowing what that's all about, except for Mr. Spock, who knows everything. And he says, Hamlet, Act 3, Scene 1 which is true because that phrase, the undiscovered country is part of the to be or not to be speech. At that point, the, the leader of the clans says, you have not experienced Shakespeare until you have read him in the original Klingon. And then Christopher Palmer says, tach, 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 that, right? Now, because of this, because you haven't experienced Shakespeare until you've read him in the original Klingon, the people in the Klingon Language Institute felt that it was their mission not to translate, but to restore the works of Shakespeare back to the original Klingon. So the first one they did was Hamlet, which makes sense because they had a head start. They already had to be or not to be, right? So not that much less work to do. So here it is, this is a Klingon English uh, book of, of Hamlet. Here's the Czech Klingon Hamlet, this is, in Klingon and Czech, there's no English in it at all. And if this doesn't prove that Shakespeare was not originally written in Klingon, I don't know, I don't know what does. Um, and they've also done Much Ado About Nothing and some of the sonnets. They've done work on Romeo and Juliet and so on. 
you'd think they'd do Macbeth. Anyhow, um, if you go on Google, there's a way to get your Google main page in, in Klingon, you know, rather than, rather than English or French or something or other. I think you could do similar things in Facebook. There's Klingon apps. The best one, there's a dictionary app called Bookwit uh, for, both, for both iPhone and Android. Uh, it's really, really good. Uh, if you go to Bing Translate, use the Bing Translator, you can do Klingon. Uh, Google cannot. Bing cannot either. It's, it's there, but don't do it. <laughs> it's, it, it, it keeps getting better, but it's, it's, got, it's got a way to go. Uh, it was, uh, uh, Klingon was incorporated in, in the Big Bang Theory a lot. Uh, you could take a tour of the Air and Space Museum in Washington. When you go to the museum and take a tour, um, and on your iPhone, I think, or on the phone, you could listen to listen to a, a Klingon guide of the, of the main exhibits and so on. There's a Klingon Christmas Carol. That, that's Tiny Tim, Tim Holm, Little Tim, um, which has been produced for the past 10 or 12 years, except for most recently when it hasn't been, which is a terrific take on that story. It's very, it's very, very funny. Uh, there's the Klingon opera. Ooh, it's called, which means universe, opera entirely in Klingon, Klingon music, um, everything else. This was produced in the Netherlands in 2010, I think was, was the first time and they, they performed it, I don't know, a dozen times maybe. Um, uh, as I mentioned, there's, you know, there's a whole bunch of these, these kind of Klingon projects, all these songs and stories and plays. And, and except for the opera, which, which I did the bulk of the translation on, except for the opera, I didn't work on any of these things. You know, I didn't do any of those translations that we were talking about. Um, didn't do any of this online stuff. Other people did all of the compositions and all of the translations. All their work is based on what I've done. You know, they don't create any new words or any new grammar, but they're doing all the work. And now here's something else that I didn't work on, which is because the Klingons are back again. Somewhat too far back in, in uh, Star Trek Discovery, which is the new one on, on, on uh, streaming services. Um, the Klingons are in the first season, were in it a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, and they spoke a lot. And it was the, the most intense, uh, the most usage of Klingon ever. And, and when the Klingons spoke to each other, they spoke Klingon, right? And, they, and the Klingons spoke to each other a lot. So there's a whole, all kinds of stuff in there. And what, what, what this slide here is all about is this program Discovery in the US, it's, it's on, well, now it's on something called Paramount Plus. In Canada, it's on something or other. But in the whole rest of the world, it's on Netflix. And on Netflix in general, not just for Star Trek, and Netflix, you can get subtitles in other languages. So if it's an English language show, you can watch with German subtitles. If it's a French show, you can watch with Spanish subtitles and so on. Star Trek Discovery, you can watch the entire show, not just when they're talking Klingon, you can watch the entire show with Klingon subtitles. And this is an example of one, the, the, the audio here is this, they were speaking, they were speaking English. Uh, it translates as some, something like, you know, if we can't hail Saru, we'll be trapped here during the storm, something like that. Uh, well, I didn't do any of that either, okay? Uh, one of the best Klingon speakers in the world, a Canadian woman lives in Vancouver, did the bulk of the translation for Discovery, helped out sometimes by a, a guy in Indiana. Uh, a Belgian who lives in Germany did the subtitles for, for all of this stuff. There's a, a English, British guy who lives in Kentucky who helps out with, or did help out with the Big Bang Theory. For Star Trek Lower Decks, which is one of the newer things, they got some Klingon translation done by basically putting out a bid on uh, Facebook and getting some volunteers to do it. So they don't need me anymore. Actually, that's not quite true because you know I have contributed. I, I'm, I'm still involved with this stuff and all the words and everything are mine. Uh, I've worked on Discovery, uh, but not on Klingon. Um, I still get questions from the Klingon speakers about grammar and lots, it's understatement, lots of requests for vocabulary. 
So I haven't retreated, I haven't retired, okay? But Klingon has kind of wandered off on its own, like a, like a good child should. And I see this as a good thing. I, 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 don't, I don't feel left out or obsolete, and, it, and it's you know, kind of rewarding, because something that started 42 years ago that was supposed to be, according to the guys who did it, a few nonsense syllables and grunts and hisses has become, you know, according to the Guinness World Records, by far the most widely spoken fictional language. Now, I have no idea whether that's true, but whether it is or not true, I'm not taking any credit for that either because I didn't do that. The speakers did it. And to that, I, I, I say maj, which means good. And I also say pick, which means that's it. I'm done now. We got through this PowerPoint thing more or less. So, so now if anyone has any questions, you can hopefully return this to its normal configuration and it'll work. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you so much. That was, that was really, really interesting. Um, I think you can end your uh, screen share by like going to the bottom right corner. There's like a little red button where you can stop share. Um, yeah, if anybody has any questions, um, please raise your hand and um, um, I can call on you um, using the rate, raise hand feature. Um, we, Mad Madeline. Madeline. Yeah, I actually had um, a couple questions. Um, my first was, I was wondering, so you said that none of the grammar or vocab, they didn't change any of the grammar or vocabulary. Was anything about the language, did you see any evolution of it, like even in the accent or, or well, idioms? Yeah. The accent is, is, is subject to the actors and, yeah, and the actor's skill and stuff like that. There was no, no intentional change to pronunciation. In Discovery, uh, when it first came out, a lot of people said to me, oh, their Klingon is so strange. It sounds so strange. Their pronunciation is actually very good. The delivery, the dramatic delivery is very uh, Shakespearean actually. It's just very over the top sometimes. That, that was a directorial choice and an actor's choice, but, but they're doing fine. They also have stuff in their mouth that, that interferes that the other actors didn't have. And they also do some electronic enhancement to make them sound a little bit different. What about among the fans? Among, among the fans, uh, again, there's some informal grammatical uh, innovation that they do, but they all recognize that it doesn't count, so to speak. Uh, the pronunciation everyone tries to do is as good as they possibly can. So that, that's not changing. Over time, it probably will. There are dialects of Klingon. Uh, it's in some book I wrote, I talk, about, I talk about that. And in one of the movies, there's actually a different dialect of Klingon. Uh, when the, movies, when the movie came out, we managed to escape the phone the whole time until now. That's pretty good. Um, when, when, when the movie came out, people heard that other dialect and said, oh, those people, those actors spoke England, English so poorly. No, they didn't. They spoke it exactly right. They're just speaking a different dialect. It was on purpose. No, go away. Uh, thank you. Does anybody have any other questions? We had one submitted separately, which um, I, I thought was I saw, okay. pretty pretty interesting. Um, what are your thoughts on the Duolingo take on Klingon? Well, I didn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> uh, I think I think it's really good. I mean, you know, if, if you like Duolingo, they did a they did a they did a great job. Um, there, it was a, done by a team of three people primarily. It was an international effort, one American, one Swede. And yeah, I think that one was German who was involved. Um, there's still, they, they, they still had a few points that they disagreed with each other about. And they've asked me to sort of be the referee. So there's some things to still iron out in there, but it's, it's, a, it's a good course. There's somebody I know who didn't know any Klingon at all, who is now a fluent speaker of Klingon and he learned it from Duolingo and then other things after that. 
I had a question. Um, what language you mentioned, there's only 1% of languages um, that have the object, verb, subject, yeah. order. Which one is it in? in the, I, have to, I have to look up their names. They're in, they're in uh, Central America, Brazil. So tribal, like tribal yeah. languages. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Jasmine, are you raising your hand? Yeah, um, I'm not sure if you said this already. If you did, I didn't catch it. Um, so you said you get a lot of requests for like new vocabulary. So do you usually just say no, like you can use like this existing word instead or like do you come up with a word and like post it on your Facebook or something and let everybody know? <laughs> yeah, it's most, mostly coordinated through the Klingon Language Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, they compile a list. They have some complicated algorithm for doing this where the, the, the requests get weighted somehow or other and you can I don't know what they're doing um, so I'll get a list and if I'm going to get one their next their next meeting is in July so probably in June or something I'll get a list um, and I'll go through and, and what I do you know what your your question was very astute because if I look at it and say oh we already have a way to say that or I can expand semantically this particular word to cover that. Okay, so I, I want to avoid making up new words if I can. Uh, just just not, 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 not out of laziness, but because that's the way languages work. Uh, and also there's only so many syllables to go around, you know. Um, but, you know, the, I'll, I'll make them up. The requests I get other than that come from people who, who are working on a particular project. So when the guy was working on translating, you know, the little prince, for example, he'd ask questions, you know, how, what's, how am I going to say sheep, you know, and all these kinds of things. Um, but they're, they're kind of ad hoc as we're going away. And then those things get disseminated either, either there's an there's a, a online list of, uh, that, uh, that people subscribe to, I guess, that, that anybody can, that you can get on. And then, you know, somehow it gets out on, on this Bokwe app that I was mentioning, the, the, the iPhone app or the Android app. If, if, if I breathe a new word today, it'll be on there tomorrow. I don't know how that happens. It does. And that, that's sort of uh, uh, curated by a guy in Switzerland. So like how many new words do you think you're making every year? Like because, of their, because of this wish list, probably about a, a 100, 150. Cool. When the book first came out, that little blue dictionary first came out on the on the back of it, you know, the publisher writes a blurb so people will pick it up in the bookstore and buy it, you know, I guess. And it said something about, you know, learn the, the, the fastest growing language in the universe, it said. And I said to them, how can you say that? How do you know that this is the fastest growing language in the universe or the galaxy or whatever? And what she said to me was, how many words are there in Klingon? And at the time there was, there was maybe 2000. She so said, if you add a word to Klingon percentage wise, that's a lot more than if you add a word to English or French or, or Spanish. Yeah. Therefore it's the fastest growing language in the universe. Any other questions? Now's your time. Yeah. Madeline? I have a second question. I was wondering what you thought, this isn't Klingon, but I was wondering what you thought of the language in um, the Next Generation episode, Darmok, and whether you think oh, that's oh, a, yeah. a good theory of, of a non-human language. Right. Well, it, that one, that's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, yeah. If, if you don't know what that is, they, they speak in parables, basically. So in, in this, instead of saying, you know, I want to go to town, they, they with, with, with the Dharmak, Dharmak at the something, arms akimbo, I, don't, I can't remember what these things are. And then, and then since everybody knows the mythology, they know what they're talking about. Um, I think it's very clever, very smart. I think, I think Picard was very clever, very smart. Or, and, and the other folks, you know, to figure it out. It's not a different language, they were speaking English. And if they were speaking their own language through a universal translator, and that's why we heard it in English, okay? Um, 
that, that that's just using the language in a very strange way. Okay, but the language itself is there's not nothing particularly esoteric about. It. Of course, if it's again, if it's gone to the universal translator, we have no idea what they were saying. Uh, on the other hand, the universal translator is pretty smart to know all of this mythology and get it right. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, anybody else? All right, well, um, we really, really appreciated your time today. That was a very interesting talk. Thank, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry that that whole technical thing happened, but you know. That would worked out. It worked somehow. <laughs> okay. All right, bye-bye everybody. You.